Hello everyone and welcome again to my YouTube channel. I hope you're well in whatever it is you're doing, if it's revision for exams. That time of year, I hope you're doing okay, I hope everything's going well for you. In today's video we're going to be looking at Piano by D.H. Lawrence. We're going to be looking at the poem, a little bit of a background about him, what he was known for. We're going to look at the analysis of it. As usual, the rhythm, form and meter, the rhyme scheme, and we'll have a, in a nutshell for you as well, telling you what you need to know to be successful in your exam. So, without any further ado, let's get into it. Okay, Piano, D.H. Lawrence. Okay, so let's start off with this biography. Remember, you need to know the context of the writer, what he or she was about, and the time they were living in to really be successful when you're writing your essays and to get all those contexts and background kind of marks. So, David Herbert Lawrence, or D.H. Lawrence, was born the 11th of September 1885 in Eastwood, Nottinghamshire in England, and he died on the 2nd of March 1930 in Vence in France, not Venice, in Italy. Okay. He grew up in a working class family, unfairly characterised by the end of his life as a pornographer, someone who only wrote erotic stories. Certainly at the time he wrote some really salacious, scandalous stories. Very erotic for the time he was living in. Very erotic, some of them. Very racy. Um, but it's unfair to characterise him like this. He wrote some really good stories as well. He explored both heterosexual and, again, controversially for the time, homosexual scenes as well, which pervaded his work. Many internal battles within his own sexuality. He explored his own sexuality through his writing. He fell in love, however, and married a woman, Frida who was also unfaithful to him, although he enjoyed dalliances perhaps with other, with other people. Um, she served as his muse, his uh, inspiration, and a central character in his most famous works, including in The Violent, The Woman Who Rode Away, and also his most famous, arguably his most famous piece of work, Lady Chatterley's Lover. She was his inspiration for these, po for these poems and books. His opinions earned him many enemies, and he endured official persecution, censorship, and misrepresentation of his creative work throughout the second half of his life, much of which he spent in a voluntary exile he called his savage pilgrimage. Very literature and very poetic of him to refer to it in such a way. But he did, he, he left the UK and, 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 and he, and he, and he travelled really voluntarily. He, he was in exile, he felt he, he wasn't accepted by society. And there was a lot of controversy and criticism of him at home in Britain at the time. Many see him in 21st century uh, criticism. Remember, viewing him through the eyes in 2019 is not the same as even back then. He was controversial then for the scenes he was depicting within his works. We can view him as being very controversial now, perhaps through his attitudes and descriptions of women and what he does to women. Many can see him as a violent misogynist, someone who doesn't like women, who believes that men are superior to them and have control and ownership of them, with almost a violent hatred for women. Viewed by some as an early type of feminist, however, so there's these two sides to them, these con contrasting sides. Decide for yourself what you feel. Uh, to really be getting good grades, especially at A-level, be reading around his other works in a university and beyond. Viewed by some as an early type of feminist, as I say, for creating strong, complex female characters. Others view him, as I said, as a violent misogynist. The critic Kate Millett says that The Woman Who Rode Away shows human sacrifice performed upon the woman to the greater glory and potency of the male. He's just an abuser. Likewise, friends such as the famous Bertrand Russell, who was a writer, philosopher, historian, a logician, a logician, sorry, not a magician. He didn't do magic tricks. That we know of. Who knows? Maybe he did. Who knows? A social critic and a political activist. This guy did it all, Bertrand Russell. Have a Google of him, check him out. He characterised Lawrence as a great proto-German fascist, saying, I was a firm believer in democracy, boasting a little bit, whereas he had developed the whole philosophy of fascism before the politicians had thought of it. Called himself a friend, so interesting. But like his view of women, he was also at odds, D.H. Lawrence, with his political beliefs, once writing himself, I believe a good form of socialism, it, if it could be brought about, would be the best form of government. 
but obviously with the, the conditional if it could be brought about suggests that it wouldn't necessarily be able to and therefore perhaps he doesn't believe there is a possibility in being a good form of socialism so let's characterise D.H. Lawrence was he a feminist or a misogynist uh, was he controversial or not was it, was it beauty he was writing or was it pornography was he a fascist or a socialist I'll let you make up your own mind but it's good to know these basics just so that we know what uh, everything else is with regards to him and the writing that he then created and to have that background to help you within when you're writing exams. Okay, it's already here, but let's go in a nutshell. What is this poem about, I hear you ask? Let me tell you. It's written from the perspective of a man reminiscing about his childhood. Is this man a happy man? I don't think so. His memories are created in a dreamlike state or a trance. It's, 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 it's almost like he's having visions. He misses his childhood and furthermore the love of his mother. This very much comes through. Certainly uh, it feels as if the adult is missing a woman in his life and we can suggest it's perhaps a mother, perhaps a lover, but it feels like a mother figure. It's full of sadness, this poem, the speaker, that he cannot return to those days. Stanza one begins with him falling into this trance through a woman singing to me. Stanza two begins with him to, starts with him back as being an adult again in the present day, before the power of his memories take him back into his childlike state, despite him not as a conscious adult necessarily wanting to go back, perhaps wanting to not be hurt by such memories. But by stanza three, it begins with the realization things have changed, that it's impossible for him to revisit those days, and it finishes in a, with him in a great fit of sadness and melancholy. This is what it's about in a nutshell. Is that enough for you to pass exa an exam? I don't think so. We're going to have to de-analyse this. Okay, let's get in about it. Stanza one. Softly in the dusk, a woman is singing to me, taking me back down the vista of years till I see a child sitting under the piano in the boom of the tingling strings and pressing the small, poised feet of a mother who smiles as she sings. Oh, D.H. Lawrence. Really nice imagery, no? This is really warm. It's a nice, warm comfortable stanza. It takes us back. It makes us feel quite happy to be listening to this. It makes us happy to um, perhaps even takes us back ourselves to some childhood memories we might have some of us if we're fortunate enough. Uh, let's get about it. We start off with the word choice of softly and dusk, okay? Word choices of these softly and dusk, it sets a gentle, comforting tone right from the outset, straight from the beginning. We're set, we're set with a comfortable, comforting tone. The use of commas break up the lines. Caesura, remember, don't just say, oh, caesura, in, a po in, a, in an essay. Make sure you spell it right as well. Don't just say, the writer uses caesura after the word dusk. Explain why the writer uses caesura. It's, uh, it breaks up the line, why? It breaks up the line to allow us to take these pauses. It allows us to create this chant-like rhythm. I'm not sure if you can see this little fella here just interrupting it. Big D.H. Lawrence fan, aren't you? This is Pete, my little cat, aren't you? Loves, the, loves piano, one of his favourite poems, isn't it? What do you think? Big fan? No? No? Not sure. Right. Don't... Try not to... Try not to interrupt. A little bit rude. He's gone. Fine. Um, where are we? Yes! It's like a chant-like rhythm again. It's not a chant, but it's, a, it's almost like a sing-song. It's almost like an echo of a song that his mother might sing to him. And it just breaks up the lines nicely here. Um, adds reassurance to the rhythm... To, to the reader, sorry. A little bit like some kind of of nursery rhyme or being sung to soothingly by a mother. And these caesura create these gentle pauses to mimic this kind of song uh, sound to us. Okay, a woman. Questions for you. Who is this woman? Is he in a bar? Is she his lover? Is it his mother? We can assume it probably is his mother, but as always with poetry, please analyse it. See what it is. Don't say it's a lover. 
and then go on and say it's talking about his childhood though. That doesn't make sense. So whatever you're going to analyse, make sure that it has consistency throughout your argument. So let's argue it, it is his, it's his mother that he's talking about. Certainly a link to this comforting, gentle tone and atmosphere already created. So we can assume it's his mother. We've got this idea she's singing to him. This first entire line evokes a feeling of love, tenderness, security and warmth. Taking me back down the vista of years, the word choice of vista means uh, visions, the visions of the previous years, it's the idea this song is transporting him back, it's transporting him back down memory lane, back to when he was a young child, when he didn't have problems, he didn't have relationship problems or money problems or just how difficult it can be to be to be an adult sometimes and the stress and responsibilities that come with it. Being a happy young child with nothing to worry about apart from who he's going to play, what game he's going to play next or something like that. Okay, um, we move on. As I see, until I see a child sitting under the piano. Have a little think here. A specific piano is the piano, the piano, a specific piano. We can assume it's the piano uh, of his childhood, a piano that was perhaps in the living room of his family home. We, we can assume, we can, we, we can, we can simply assume here. Um, the question, why is he sitting under this piano? Is it out of fear? Is it because it's security? He feels safe there? He wants to be close to his mother? Up to you, what do you think? Again, develop your own thoughts. A child sitting under the piano in the boom of the tingling strings. It juxtaposes with the word choice of softly in line one. And the tingling strings, we've got a little kind of internal line here and we've got a u internal rhyme, sorry. And we've got a use of consonants here. The tingling strings, its consonants is used to juxtapose with the boom, the boom, which is quite a heavy, strong sound. And the tingling strings, it juxtaposes the boom of the tingling strings. The boom might startle us or the child a little bit, but the tingling strings bring us back to security. Uh, tingling strings is also quite childlike language. I find myself doing this whenever I say tingling strings for some reason. So it's quite childlike language as well, you can argue. And pressing the small poised feet of a mother. He's happy, he's trying to help the mother almost. He's trying to help help her play the piano. It's quite a cute little image, it's quite a cute little vision uh, that he pre presents to us. Uh, and this mother who smiles as she sings. So it's really powerful, beautiful memories that this young, that this man is having of when he was younger. It continues and emphasizes the levels of happiness being experienced by the, both the mother and the son. And it further adds to the atmosphere of love and security. Stanza two. Starts off, in spite of myself. What does he mean by this? He's come back to reality now. He's allowed his imagination to go off and dream. And he's now back in reality here. He's back in present day. He's back in his adult body. He's back in reality, but he can't uh, maintain it. In spite of myself, against his will, this song being sung to him and the sound of the tingling strings in his, in his mind. Uh, it's too much for him, it's too strong for him, and they're dragging him back into his childlike dream state. Uh, in spite of myself, the insidious mastery of song uh, betrays me back. Let, let me actually, let, well, I'll explain this and then I'm going to read the whole stanza. So insidious, what does that mean? It just means gradually causing harm. What? That's quite a change in tone isn't it this first stanza is all a really warm comforting secure stanza and now we've got in spite of myself it's it's it's, it's something that you don't want to do it's it's he can't maintain it he might he's saying that he wants to maintain strong and he wants to he doesn't want to take he will he doesn't want to remain back he doesn't want to stay back in this childlike memories that is these visions that he's having but and he, and he's conscious in the beginning of stanza two, but nonetheless he gets dragged back into these memories. So it's a quite it's not a nice image to start off with. And then we get the insidious mastery of song. Insidious meaning gradually causing harm, an intended trap, as if it's a trap that's been set up for him. It's alluring. It's it's it makes you want to go towards it, but it's also harmful. 
And that's really quite interesting. He knows this. There's a suggestion that it's intended. Perhaps he's setting it up for himself. Perhaps his mind, perhaps his, his inner child is setting this trap up for himself. Perhaps he's almost willingly, although his adult, rational, mature self doesn't want to go back to these childhood memories of happiness. Perhaps he's almost allowing himself to fall back into these memories. Um, it's a very curious first line of stanza too though, but it's really just meaning that he doesn't want to go back into this. The insidious mastery of song, it's even though he doesn't want to and he knows it kind of causes his heart causes him harm to go back to these memories, perhaps because he's so unhappy now and it hurts him to think of these memories by going back to it. He has no option, he goes back to it. I'll quickly read the stanza. In spite of myself, the insidious mastery of song betrays me back till the heart of me weeps to belong to the old Sunday evenings at home with winter outside and hymns in the cosy parlour, the tinkling piano our guide. Tinkling, tingling strings. Huh, very nice. Okay, so in spite of myself, the insidious mastery of song betrays me back Word choice of betrays suggests that when he was young he trusted music to make him happy, but now it has the opposite effect. That's quite an interesting. The insidious, the trap, the, the deliberate trap of song, it betrays him back into his youth, even into his youth which he doesn't want. Till the heart of me weeps to belong. The heart of me, like the piano in line three, it's the heart of him. The use of the article the places even more importance on the speaker's heart. Remember we had the piano, this is the heart, the heart. It places more importance on the speaker's heart and the emotional connection to it and emphasized by the word choice of weep suggests real pain till the heart of me, not my heart, till my heart weeps to, be, till my heart cries to belong, he could have said. But to make it more powerful, he says, to the, till the heart of me weeps to belong. This idea, till the heart of me, actually suggests a rational adult disconnection with his heart. He, 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 it's perhaps suggests an absence of love in his adult life. It's disconnected. So he refers to it instead of calling it my heart, which suggests a connection and ownership over it. He, he disconnects himself from it and he refers to it as the heart of me. And it weeps, it weeps to belong to the old Sunday evenings at home. He personifies his heart, personification he's using, he's giving it the emotions of crying. His heart weeps to belong to the old Sunday evenings at home, the old memories of him at, child, at home as a child with his family. The Sunday evenings again, comfort, warmth, happiness, linking right back with stanza one. And it's with winter outside and hymns in the cosy parlour, juxtaposing with winter outside, the warm parlour, the living room basically, and hymns, religious songs, suggesting a religious family. They're singing hymns, which are church songs together. They're singing these together in the family room, by in the cosy parlour, probably with a, with, a, with a natural fire, you would imagine, and a piano. Um, really very nice imagery. Very middle class imagery, I suppose, as well, which is obviously with 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 D.S. Lawrence growing up in a working class young young uh, as a young man in the nineteenth century would be unlikely that he would have had such commodities. So the speaker isn't necessarily him. Don't be confused necessarily. Anyway. I digress. Um, and our tinkling piano, the tinkling piano, sorry, the, again, the tinkling piano are a guide. Tinkling another examinal, ex examinal? Examinal? Examinal amanatopoeia? I don't know where that came from, sorry. Tinkling, another example of onomatopoeia in the poem onomatopoeia, remember, when words are written as they sound. Tinkling, a little bit like tingling strings. Um, suggesting the power of music, the tinkling piano is perhaps even stronger than religion, the hymns. Piano also metaphorically guides him to his childhood memories. The, the mastery of song, the piano guides him back down to his childhood memories. Okay guys, we're almost there. Stanza three, finally. Okay, so now it is a vain for the singer to burst into clamour with the great black piano appassionato. The glamour of childish days is upon me. My manhood is cast down in the flood of remembrance. I weep like a child for the past. 
Okay, let's get about this, uh, this third stanza. So now, so symbolizes the Volta, the turn of the poem. He reconciles it's impossible for him to actually be as happy as he was as the child. It's impossible for him to return to these days that he had as a child. Now tells us he's back in the present day. He's now reflecting in reality. It is vain, it's pointless for the singer, is this the same singer in line one, his mother or someone else, to burst into clamour like they did when he was a child. Burst also linking with boom, this idea of a sudden explosion of noise if you like. With the great black piano appassionato, uh, the word choice of great further emphasises not only the size but also how good it was as he was a child. The appassionato is something which is sung with great passion. The full stop in the middle, it forces a pause for the repetition and allows for the noise of the imagined song to quieten down before moving on. I'm just simply meaning to burst into clamour so we've got enjambment. We've got enjambment all throughout the end of, the, the end of these three first lines of the, fourth, of the third stanza. It burst into clamour, the glamour is cast. Why? so that he's put the full stops in the commas, the caesura, into the middle of the lines to create the pauses here. So now it is, va is vain for the singer to burst into clamour with the great black piano appassionato. The glamour of childish days is upon me. My manhood is cast down in the flood of remembrance. I weep like a child for the past. The caesura in the middle of these lines slow it down in a different way. Burst into clamour with the great black piano appassionado. Appassionato, sorry. It allows us to build in voice and in strength. Then the full stop makes a pause. And that allows us to quieten down. It creates that great uh, passion, the, the sound of, of, the, of the roar of the voice. The glamour we're told suggesting that life is now a lot less glamorous without such voices and such music traditions. The glamour of childish days is upon me. My manhood is cast. There's a juxtaposition here, the ideas of what it is to be a man, a little bit like Rudyard Kipling's If, which is also available, obviously. Check out the channels, like and subscribe, all these sorts of things, obviously. It's analysed here for you. Uh, what it is to be a man. My manhood is cast down in the flood of remembrance. I weep like a child for the past. We've got childish, manhood, child, this juxtaposition. He's a man. He knows what it is to be a man, he feels, but he he admits that ultimately he's like a child. He feels like a child. He weeps, he cries like a child, he says. Again, it's an old-fashioned view of manhood that men can't cry. And that's something that he feels like he's almost failed. It's a feeling of failure. He's failed as a man. This is really what he's admitting to here. It's cast down in the flood of remembrance as he's been trying to suppress such memories. It's as if they're quickly now coming back to him. The word choice of flood. Um, so the word choice of flood, dangerous and destructive. They come down in a flood of remembrance as if he's had a dam holding it so back, back for so many years. But now these memories, this song, the music, the pianos created, all this resistance that he's had over the years has been burst. It's all coming back to him, and he weeps like a child for the past. Similarly, he weeps like a child, contrasting juxtaposed with his manhood, repetition of the word weep in line from line six, further emphasises the painful nature of his sorrow. And finally, for the past, the direct line, link with line nine, he has now fallen back into his past, he no longer wishes to be in the present. It's a nice poem. It's not a bad poem. It's not as bad as some other poems out there. It's not bad. Okay, very quickly, the rhyme scheme. What are we doing here? We've got me, see, string, sings. Song belong, outside, guide. Clamour, glamour, cast and past. Nice and easy, A-A-B-B. -B. Thank you very much. The rhyming meter, what's going on here? Let's have a quick look. I'll slow down a little bit here for you. We've got a stressed and an unstressed, okay? Remember, a foot, a foot contains one stressed and at least one unstressed syllable. We group them together, so we do. 
A stress syllable followed by a non-stress syllable. What do we call it? A few other poems of this. You've already read it, have you? It's a trochy, of course it is. Okay, how many are there in this line? One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, look at the length of the lines. Doesn't look like there's necessarily going to be nice, neat bunches here. We're used to iamic pentameter. Da, 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 da. Okay, what's happening here? Let's have a look. I'm gonna have to have a look at other lines here. We've got, okay, stressed, unstressed, stressed, unstressed. Okay, so we've got trochies, it looks like. Oh, okay. No, this isn't working for me. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, there's nine there as well. Okay, so the first two lines have six feet. The second two have nine feet. Look, let's just say there's an inconsistent meter in here, okay? It's not iambic pentameter where every line more or less has five uh, feet within it. Sorry, five, five feet within it. It's not working like this, okay? So therefore we can just say uh, the that the poem is tracheic, okay? Uh, there, there's not a regular, there's not regular feet within it. It's not, it's got inconsistent meter. Simple as that, okay? Why has he done that? I'll let you decide, have a think. Perhaps it's to, to deal with the inconsistencies between his life now as to what it was when he was younger. You think of that, I'll let you have a thought. Let's move on. The themes. What are the themes here? Childhood memories and nostalgia. Obviously. Reluctance. The reluctance to actually go back to his childhood memories. The, re the, the reluctance to actually perhaps address his current day problems. Symbols used. The piano itself, obviously. It's a big symbol. The woman, or the women, depending how you want to see it. The piano really symbolizing his, his childhood, symbolizing happiness, symbolizing family, warmth, comfort, security, as he sat underneath it helping his mum play. It seems to symbolize everything. The woman likewise symbolizes exactly the same things for him. This is what these symbols are and what they represent. Okay. So, not a bad little poem, okay? It's important that you are able to really look at the poetic techniques that have been used within the poem and how the writer has used them. Also remember, lots of personal opinion. Don't just use mine, but use your own personal opinion. Say why things are, are effective. Say what things suggest, what they make you think of. Why you like them, why you don't like them. Don't be afraid to disagree with, pre with different ideas that writers have or say why an image is ineffective. As always, if you've got any questions, please put them in the comments below. I will respond. As always, like if you like this video. Please let me know. Give me a like. Even better, subscribe. Click the little notification bell. What will happen is every time I upload new videos, you will be notified. I'll be uploading exam re revision tips. I'll be uploading quite a few more videos over the coming weeks as we get towards the all-important English exams. Okay, as I say, if you've got anything you'd like to add or comment on, please do so below. Until next time, keep working hard, keep revising hard and relax. You are going to be fine and the summer holidays are just around the corner. Until next time, all the best.